The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. I am back, comfortably zoned in a vat o' pine tar, the podcast about the book, which is a culmination of podcasts. This is a weird world we live in. I'm Ralph Tycho. George Grimm, my co-host on this show and my co-author of the book that we wrote together, um, is not with us. Uh, Sadly, his father-in-law is ill and um, he's got responsibilities this week, which are far more important than a podcast. And... um, uh, here we go. Um, I'm going to introduce my guest. He is the person that we were most influenced by when um, when we wrote the book. He is our hero. Uh, we'll tell you why in a minute. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome back to the network. Uh, your interview a uh, long time ago is motivated us to write the book. So, um, Don Warlow, Wardlow, uh, happy to have you. Well, thank you, Ralph. And that's mighty kind of you. And considering how difficult it is to write a book, you know, to, to think that you say I motivated you to do so, that is, that's quite something because well, you're I've been to trying be, to write a book for a long time and I'm I'm still a long way from finished. Well, what motivated us uh, naturally uh, was the fact that you, whatever you do in life, you were an underdog. You overcame a bunch of, of problems early on. First of all, let it, let it be said, you were born sightless. Yes, I was born blind, and I still am blind, and blind is the word I use. I'm not a very PC individual. Oh, well, um, I think PC is uh, has outlived its usefulness. It's The spectrum has gone the other way. The pendulum has turned. Uh, people are afraid to use words like uh example uh midget <laughs> for instance has been replaced by little people yeah. i mean i'm sure people have a, a a more important axe to grind in life when when you think about it there are bigger fish to fry than I hope so. <laughs> than that um and i i think little people is is more insulting than midget i mean a little person? Uh, what, what is that saying? Um, anyway, um, not only were you born blind, but um, you became a baseball announcer. <laughs> wow. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, talk about your love for baseball and what motivated you to break a lot of barriers. And who helped you along the way? Well, I discovered baseball completely by accident. I was not quite eight years old, just about eight years old. In March of 71, I was going to turn eight in April. And in March of 71, I, oh, for a while then, I had been listening to a radio station called WJRZ out of Hackensack, New Jersey. And that radio station at that time was the flagship station for the Mets. And I didn't know about the Mets until I started hearing these commercials on WJRZ. And the commercials had this song, Meet the Mets. And (laughs) and And the song had banjos in it. And I'm a sucker for banjos. So that's that was where it all began, and I said, "Well, I'm going to find out what this is all about, what the Mets, I mean, with this music, 
you know, what's the, what, what are the Mets like? Well, I listened to my first game of spring training baseball, and I was hooked. And 50 years later, you know, I'm a baseball lifer at age 58, and uh, now when when it came to um, my early influences, um, my my grandpa, once he found out that I discovered baseball, well, that made him a happy man because he'd been a lifelong Yankees fan. And first of all, he would tease me. He'd say the Mets were a bunch of beginners and the mm-hmm. Yankees had played forever. And and I, I really thought it was just a joke. But when my dad took me to my first Mets game, that was in 1972, and they were having some kind of a celebration about the Mets, you know, 10-year anniversary that they had begun in 1962. So I found out that Grandpa was was teasing, yes, but he actually meant it. The Mets were a bunch of beginners. They'd only been playing for 10 years, and the Yankees had been playing for 70 years. You know, right. Only later would I find out that they had once been the Islanders and then became the Yankees. And it was the, Hi- the Highlanders, yes. not the Islanders, the Highlanders. Right on. The Highlanders and who played at Hilltop Park back in from 1901 till 1913. But Grandpa would tell me the greatest baseball stories because he'd been a fan in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and he could tell me about Walter Johnson and Bob Feller. Oh, wow and Lou Gehrig, and if they'd come into Yankee Stadium, maybe he'd seen them, maybe he'd just read about them in the paper, because to his dying day, he was he was reading newspapers. You know, he was a big newspaper reader. And, right. and he, he And my, my favorite one to hear him talk about was, and he always drew the name out like I'm going to, he, he'd always call him, Grover Cleveland Alexander. That's, <laughs> that's how Grandpa would say that name. And he he told me that that man could pitch a first game of a doubleheader, go have a beer, and then pitch the second game of a doubleheader. And my mom said that Grandpa was just teasing about that. But later on, I was to discover that not only Grover Cleveland Alexander could do that, but there were other pitchers who would pitch both games of a doubleheader. And if it wasn't a beer, they might go have a shot of whiskey between games. (laughs) You know, I think it was 1972 when a Chicago White Sox pitcher, Wilbur Wood, yes, it might have been 72, 73, around there, did indeed pitch both games of a doubleheader. I was oh, listening oh. to it. It was against the Yankees. Wow. And wow. They, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't a very good Yankees team, but what I ended up doing, uh, Grandpa passed on in at the very end of 1973, and much later in either 2009 or 2010, I got the idea to write a song about all these baseball stories that that he told me and the song is called Who Was Babe Ruth Grandpa and I re- wrote it, recorded it and put it up on, on YouTube Oh wow let's look for that um, so, so if you go under you my name enough, when this interview concludes would you be good enough to send me a link to that so I could put it uh, with the podcast i uh, love to hear it. I know of your f- fantastic musical taste. You started out um, in classical music, and then for one reason or another, gravitated a bit to my favorite all-time group, Pete Seeger and the Weavers. Um, yeah. How, how, did that, how did that happen? Actually, before I ever heard Beethoven, before I ever heard any classical, I was hearing the Weavers. I'd go to my Uncle Ralph's house, 
and he had about every Weaver's record you could get. And he would play them. He played Sloop John B. You know, he'd play Michael Road a boat ashore. And, and, you know, and we, good night, I, let's not forget good night, Irene. Oh yeah, <laughs> and and <laughs> and if, if Pete Seeger was singing it and playing it on his banjo, you know, I just love that man. And later he was on Sesame Street, and I, I was never happier than when I was listening to Pete Seeger on Sesame Street. And not I only never... for his singing, not only for for his singing, but for his peaceful manner that yes. transcended to life. Um, for la- lack of a better expression, um, he was a, an influence along with Woody Guthrie um, in fighting every war. Um, going you know uh he was a, a protester and uh what a great man died died maybe five or six years ago yeah. um before i ever got to see him and um in person and um that was a disappointment but again um his voice uh, if you get the weavers in carnegie hall that album um, it's absolutely a, a top classic. ten a, a c- classic ma- um, album. So, um, from music to uh, folk music to baseball, how'd you get involved as an announcer? Um, what a tremendous endeavor! And um, who, who greased the wheels for you? Yeah, well, uh, uh, at least one person you might you might be familiar with, but it's kind of a roundabout story. Um, I I meant to be a country disc jockey. That was my plan. I was going to play country records on some small local radio station. You know, play Johnny Cash records, and that right. was the plan. That was the plan. Well, <laughs> and in <laughs> Up best to laid then. plans of my best laid plans of mice and men. Yeah, go astray. Yeah, now, How did yours go astray? I'll tell you. Um, up until up until seventy nine, when I was in high school, I'd been listening to only major league games because there's no minor league baseball in New Jersey. Not then. So I would hear the Mets. I'd hear the Phillies, the Yankees. I'm hearing the best broadcasters that ever lived. You know, Bill, Bob Murphy, Bob Murphy, Bob Murphy yeah. and Bill White, and the late and great Harry Callis. I love that man. And I was hearing the best. I mean, you hear them, you don't figure you could ever broadcast, you know, sports, especially if you're blind. But I started hearing college radio. I will never I will never know why, but I was doodling around on the radio, getting to the bottom of the dial, the high 80s and the low 90s, and it's March, and all of a sudden I'm hearing baseball. And I found out the first game was the Columbia Lions, and that it just grabbed me right where I lived. And I was hearing Columbia, and on the same dial was Fordham and Seton Hall. And there are actually several men whose names you might know who I heard as college students. One was Michael K. with Fordham. One was, oh, wow. one was Charlie Slows, who also went to Fordham. And Charlie is with the Washington Nationals. Michael K., of course, is with the Yankees. And there was Matt Lachlan, who went to Seton Hall. And he is the radio voice of the Jersey Devils. So those three guys in particular, you know, listening to them, and especially listening to Matt Lachlan, I really looked up to him. He's the one who now is with the Devils. I actually got to meet him when he was with a little radio station in our town, and I was the public address announcer for our high school. But these guys made me decide, okay, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to find a partner who will do my play-by-play 
and then I'll do the color commentary. Okay, and, uh, I have a question. I have a question for you. I'm going to throw it in right now. This is George Grimm's question. I asked him if he wouldn't um, say what uh, what was on his mind, knowing he couldn't be here. Are your senses improved? Your other senses improved? And how does that help you, or did it help you, when you're an analyst in baseball? Could you hear more than the average guy? Could you smell the grass? Could you? Uh, what was it, um, if anything at all, that was affected by uh, as an offshoot, as an offshoot of your blindness? Well. The sad truth is that your senses, your other four senses, are not truly m improved if you're blind. It just doesn't work like that. In fact, my hearing isn't particularly good. My hearing never was particularly good, and as I get older, it gets worse. So when I'm out in public, uh, as often as not, I wear a hearing aid. Um, but I will okay. tell you, I will tell you that. What hearing I do have, I use to listen more effectively, and I learned to do that in high school and college, and I've used it you know, all the way up you know, to, to hear what's being said and try to formulate the best answer to go with it. Mm -hmm. And when we were broadcasting, I would listen to try and hear the pop of the catcher's mitt when some when a pitcher was throwing into him and the crack of the bat and uh, a couple of guys, Manny Ramirez is one. The crack of the bat when Manny hit it, that sounded different than you know, some Mendoza line hitter, usually the ones who played on our teams. You know, I flash back to an early memory of Ali of mine Ali Reynolds warming up in the Yankee bullpen. The Super Chief. And the Super Chief. And the ball popped into the catcher's mitt differently. The sound of the, the, than any other, other pitcher I've ever heard. It, it was absolutely amazing. Um, and this Ali Reynolds, for those baseball fans out there, who are curious about the tidbits that uh, Don and I and George are curious about. Ali Reynolds led the Yankees basically to five world championships in a row. I thought he was, if you had to take one player that played on all five championships and made the most difference, uh, it, it was Allie Reynolds. Uh, he was a reliever and a starter. He was a spot starter. Um, and he was just great. The Chief was uh, one of my uh, my idols um, as a kid. So um, I'm glad I, you remember the, the Super Chief. Now that was before <laughs> your time. Um, but after your time was the New York Med Championship in 1969. So when you had bragging rights with your grandfather you could, to, to what team to root for, that was a biggie because in just seven years, they went from literally the worst team in baseball history, record-wise. They lost 120 games in 1962 to win the championship in 1969. And their manager, Gil Hodges, was just inducted to the Hall of Fame. Um, how'd that make you feel? Fantastic. It should have happened. Okay. Oh, it should have happened so many years ago. And, you know, I was actually too late for this 69 World Series. I didn't discover the game until 71. But Hodges was their manager all through 71, and April 4th, 1972, day before my birthday, Grandpa was over, 
and come a news bulletin on the TV that he heard that Gil Hodges, that Gil Hodges had died. And he told yep. me that, and I just, I couldn't believe it. That was my first experience with a baseball person dying, you know, finding out that they were, you know, regular people just like us, that they were flesh and blood. And nine months later, we all got another jolt when Roberto Clemente's plane crashed in the ocean off Puerto Rico. And on I New, just... And New Year's Eve, I think it was. I, New I, Year's got that, Day, or... I got that bullet in the next morning, and I just felt sick. I just... And I couldn't... I couldn't put it in words why that made me feel sick, because I wasn't a Pirates fan. But it just did. It, I, I, I couldn't help it. You know, he was... You know, he'd been playing only a couple months before, and now he was dead in the plane crash. And he was on a goodwill mission to serve humanity. And I yeah. think that's that's prob- probably, looking back, what contributed to your um, feelings of, of hopelessness or um, sadness at that time was humanity was had this man taken away that, you know, there's an expression, the good die young and, you know, all that. But, um, it doesn't matter young or old. If, if you are one of the people that put your own life, bef- um, to help exactly. others like it, like he was doing. Yeah. T- truly tragic. Um, and um oh, boy uh uh how about if i sum up um sum it all up in in one in one um uh, um in one sentence it ain't fair how about that it's yeah, just you life, know, life you know just between, isn't fair. you know between hodges and and Clemente and Six years later, we lost Thurman Munson. That was right. that was a rough one. Um, a few a few years ago, I wrote an article, and I wrote it as an audition for a magazine called Consumer Vision Magazine, and the article was headlined "After Forty Years, We Still Grieve." And it was written on the 40th anniversary of Munson being killed. And mm-hmm. I wrote about how different that world was from t- from today's world and how slowly we got the news back in 1979 compared to how rapidly we get it today. Today it would come in on Facebook or Twitter. Back then we'd have to wait and there was no... No 24-hour radio for sports. The fan out of New York hadn't even started yet, and ESPN was just just on the very beginning stages. They weren't ready to become what they are now. So I had to sit and wait and wait and wait for a sports report to say, you know, that Munson had been killed. One of my sisters had told me, but I just couldn't hardly believe it. I had to hear it. You know, on the radio to know it was for real. Yeah. How about another sum up? Mortality sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just says, it says it all, um, and it, it always will. And um, uh, let's take it to a um, an uplifting thing. What was your first game like? You were partnered. Um, with someone who did play by play, you were the announcer. What what did it feel like in your stomach before? Yeah. Were there knots or were you at ease? Were you prepared for it? Did you feel prepared? Were you ill prepared? Um what went through your head? Well, this is interesting. Um in the fall of nineteen eighty two at Glassboro, no, 83, this is the fall of 83, at Glassboro, where I went to college. It's now called Rowan, 
but it was Glassboro State in New Jersey when I went there. And there was a list in the radio station, and the list was 17 names, and they all claimed to work in the sports department. And one by one, I went to that list, and one by one, every one of them said no, they didn't want to work with a blind man. And I finally got to the last guy on the list. And he wasn't the last guy because of talent. He was the last guy because I couldn't reach him. I couldn't get a phone number for him. Uh, When I left messages, he never returned them. He still doesn't return messages, you know, 40 (laughs) years later. But I I had a five-minute scoreboard show, and I was doing that one night, and I come out of the studio, and I hear... And I hear Jim Lucas, the guy I've been stalking for months, and he says, hey, Don, nice job. And those four words changed my life because I said, you're Jim Lucas. And obviously he stepped back a pace or two because he wasn't used to anybody recognizing him and just saying, you're Jim Lucas. Even though he'd been on the radio, he had a DJ show, and he had done – Uh, both basketball and baseball the season before. And I had tape recorded him doing those games, and I didn't have many tapes to play with. So I played those games repetitiously. And I listened to Jim, and I was thinking, I really, really want to work with him if I can. But finally, finally, I I heard him, and I said, you're Jim Lucas. And (laughs) that Jim... We need to we, we we need to talk. I something something I really want to talk to you about, and um, and me I said I'd like we should go back to my dorm and discuss it there, and he he went along with that and we went to my dorm. It turned out he'd stayed in that dorm. We went down the hallway and Jim said I lived on on the end of this corridor, and the end was. Room 122, which was now my room. He had lived in my room a couple of years earlier. Wow. I knew two things. I knew something special was happening, and I knew where the empty pizza boxes and beer cans had come from. (laughs) So so I said to him, I said to him, Jim, are you up to a challenge? I said, would you broadcast with a blind man? And he thought about it for maybe a minute at the most, and he said, yes, I'd broadcast with you. Now, it wasn't baseball season. You know, basketball was about to start. And I said, I really want to start doing something before we have a chance to lose touch with each other. You know, I don't want to wait till baseball season. And the the sports director at the station wanted no part of it. So what Jim did was he said, let us make a recording of of the next home game. And at the same time, we'll record what your station is putting out. And you listen to both. And and Jim said, you you tell us if we're that bad that we're, we're we really stink and don't belong on your station, then we'll go away. So that's what we we made a recording of our version of the game and it was Glassboro against William Patterson and at the same time we made a recording of the what what the radio station was putting out and we you got the chance to do a handful of games i think we did either two or three basketball games that season now, the interesting thing was uh, the night before that game, it's uh, beginning of December, and all of a sudden I, I was thinking, I don't know how to score basketball. I mean, I know how to score baseball. That's, you know, easy enough. They always tell you how to score it on the radio, but right. I, don't have, I don't have a clue how to score a basketball game. And I don't know if there's a basketball game on that I can try and invent a scoring system. And I was lucky as all get out because late that Friday night, there was a game on 
WBT out of Charlotte, and it was the Carolina Tar Heels. I don't remember their opponent, but I do remember it was Woody Durham doing the broadcast. And if you have to learn how to invent a scoring system, you know, listen to Woody Durham call a ball game. And I spent that evening, I was up pretty late that night, scoring that North Carolina game against whoever they were playing out on the West Coast. And by the end, I had at least a workable system for our Glassboro game the next afternoon. You know, I don't know what now, would was this the was this the ABA at that time? No, it was college. The Carolina no, but Charlie. What, what you were score? What you were scoring? The game that you were scoring. Yeah, that was the University of North Carolina Tar Heels basketball oh, okay. game. Oh, okay. You no, know, I wanted okay. it to be a college game, so it'd be like what we were going to be doing. So, okay, I was you very lucky that the Tar Heels had a game on. Absolutely, that's um, another one of those serendipity things. Yeah, you know it. <laughs> And that's what life is made up of, you know, mm-hmm. little things that connect from here to there. And um, I just want you to know that my grandfather was a big influence on my baseball fanaticism, as was yours. So we have that in common. And uh, both men uh, passed in the early 70s. Uh, yours in seventy three. I think mine was uh, was in seventy two, and uh, I certainly miss them. Um, I certainly miss my grandfather, and I'm sure you miss yours. Um, what are, What are some of the other things that your grandfather taught you be be that you could remember that you'd like to call upon that didn't have anything to do with sports? Life's lessons. Well, actually, (laughs) this one did have something to do with sports, but it's something you need to know in life anyway. Uh, And it took Grandpa a lot of teaching, because I can be thick-headed sometimes, but he taught me how time zones work. You know, Eastern time, Central time, Mountain and Pacific time. Because I came to him all bewildered because I said, well, the Mets are supposed to be on. It's 8 o'clock. And he said, well, he said, where are they playing? And I said, San Diego. And he said, oh, that's in California. It's, when it's 8 o'clock here, it's only 5 o'clock out there. And he, had, he I, I don't know how many times he had to tell me that to get that through my thick skull. That, that's that's one and well, later on one lesson I have, has helped you to this day because you and I are in different time zones and we yeah. had to hook up that way so um, I'm but in California grandpa. yeah thanks to grandpa um, but me and my lesson. dad they both they both taught me about sportsmanship you know and how to how to be a good loser um, dad said very early dad said if you're going to be a baseball fan, you better adjust to your team losing because even the best baseball team loses uh, quite a bit. So he said, you don't want to get all worked up over one particular baseball game. And that, I'll admit, that took some teaching also, but eventually Dad got it through my head. But Grandpa taught me to play cards. And he, you know, he he, uh, oh, he he loved to hear me, you know, play piano once I started taking lessons. And he loved to hear me sing. He had all kinds of records, and he'd put them on, and I'd sing along with them. You want you want to sing a little a cappella of this of the song you recorded for yeah, the, for us. The, the chorus of that song goes, Who was Babe Ruth, Grandpa? Who was Lou Gehrig? When will I be big enough to go to a game? Won't you tell me my Cobb and Feller and Johnson and that man Alexander now? What was his name? 
Grover Cleveland. Got it, and that's why I would I would say, what was his name? Because so so I could hear Grandpa, you know, run it out. Grover Cleveland Alexander. Mm-hmm. And only <laughs> later on, only one guy would do a name that same way. Howard Cosell would say Jack Roosevelt Robinson in that same way that Grandpa, <laughs> that Grandpa would say Grover Cleveland Alexander because yes, Robinson was. was an extremely special man, of course, you know, in his own way. Just well, you, know, a you real can say that about breaker. Howard also. Howard was a very special man <laughs> in one his of own kind. way. And one of my idols. <laughs> what? Oh, absolutely. Um, I could tell you Howard Cosell's stories. <laughs> when I was a kid growing up in New York, we'd go down for autographs uh-huh. to the hotels and what have you. Um, and uh, we mostly visitor, visiting players. And Howard was... Uh, at that time, WINS, I think it was, uh, that was the station. I, I could be wrong, but uh, it's been a long time. And he he haunt the same hotels and lobbies looking for interviews. He was a young, uh, rel- relatively young. He wa- um, he had served as a major in in World War II. Yeah. Um, and um so he came to to announcing uh late in life relatively but yeah. he was uh, new at it when uh we would encounter him um looking for interviews and uh i w- went down for autographs with my friend the bear who was in len rosenblum and len was an unbelievably avid Giants fan. And as you know, the time slots were different. The Giants were playing three hours later on the West Coast. This is earlier on the West Coast. And he runs in, the Bear runs into Howard, or vice versa. And two two gruff people, let me tell you. And uh, the Bear says, uh, Hey Howard, uh, did you get a score of the the Giants game? And Howard messes with his head, and he says, "Oh, the Giants lost six two or some something like that." And the bear later finds out that the Giants didn't lose, or he had just bullshitted them, or whatever. And Sixteen years old, the bear is like two hundred and twenty pounds himself ah. at, at that age, and he goes over to Howard. He says, "I don't care who you are. Ah. The next time you bullshit me is ah. your last time." <laughs> He's oh, oh. threatening Howard Cosell. I'll oh, talk to you another time, Leonard. This is not, not the time we can talk about that. <laughs> Uh, he he was a one to, of a kind. They got to be friendly, and mm. I remember Howard doing. You're you're a Met fan, but you came to the Mets a little late. Howard would do in their early years, sixty two and sixty three. Howard would do the pregame show, we and the aftergame show, and yeah. this is how. And I don't know if you. Heard stories about this, but he would say, "This is how it goes, This is the pregame show, along with Big Number Thirteen, Ralph Branca. Ralph Branca. That, that was his co-host. And I, from studying Jackie all these years, and I thought what um, him breaking into the big leagues." was as important to society as it was baseball. And um, Martin Luther King said to Jackie Robinson when, uh, said about Jackie Robinson when they said, you're the godfather of civil rights. He says, no. The, The person that made the most difference was Jackie Robinson because he reached more people through through baseball. And uh, what he and Mr. Ricky did was monumental. 
And um, but Ralph, Brandt, my point was the person who greased the wheels for Jackie the most when he came up was Big Ralph Number Thirteen Branca. He was a teammate that made it most easy for Jackie. Um, of course, Pee Wee Reese gets a lot of that credit, Kill Hodges, yeah. they, and they all deserve it. But more than anything, Jackie always credited Big Ralph. Now, they were doing, Howard Cosell was doing the pregame show, and they had Jackie Robinson on a lot. And Jackie resented the fact that they were losing, so it was so easy to lose. And Casey was such a a um, a fan guy and a press guy, but he wasn't doing much to turn things around, win win loss around. And Jackie was lobbying for that job, and he should have, by all rights, gotten that job. That's now, I had no uh, idea he, I had no idea he wanted the Mets job, but uh, truth, truthfully, nobody in the world could have fixed their wagon. It, 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 they, it's lucky they did in eight years get as far as they got because of the 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 handicaps that were were thrown at them at the beginning, the kind of players they were allowed to draft in the expansion well, draft were only the very bottom of the barrel, you know, major leaguers and then minor leaguers. So the Mets, you know, had had two strikes against them every time they came up to the plate and every time they started a game. Well, you know, Nobody was you know gonna... who was most responsible for their rise and their comeback from that, that uh, disastrous start and the first few years? They were truly terrible. They put Whitey Herzog in charge of player development. Yeah. And Whitey Herzog built that team, the 69 Mets. He had his hands all over that that team. And when Gil tragically passed away, they gave the job to Yogi Berra. Yeah. They would have been better served giving it to Whitey Herzog. That's mm. my opinion. And, that, would have um, been, that would have been great if Herzog had that team in 72. That's when Rusty got hurt. And then they no. won They won the pennant in 73, and they beat the Reds in an amazing five-game series. And, and they, play, they played the A's, and that was game six was the only World Series game I've ever attended. And I came away from that game as a Met fan thinking, knowing they'd lose the next day. Yeah. I was absolutely heartbroken. I was an adult. And I felt like crying. I don't remember if I, if tears came out, but they might have. Um, it was a game when um, uh, they started um, um, Tom Seaver instead yeah. of holding him for for Game Seven, and um, right. That and they uh, didn't that use George Stone. They didn't That's trust George right. Stone. George Stone, along with Harry Parker, made for one of the greatest bullpens, along with uh, Tug McGraw as a closer, but uh, they were great relief pitchers and spot starters. In those days, pitchers were pitchers, and uh, that's exactly right. They should have used George Stone the day I was there, yeah. and... Um, and have then, fever for Game Seven. Game Seven. On I just want rest. to say one more, th uh, one more thing in relationship to uh, Gil Dine. They cheaped out, did the Mets, and instead of calling a press conference and paying for a press conference later on to announce 
Yogi Berra as the next manager, they picked Gil's funeral to announce Yogi's hiring. Wow. That that was as Bush a move as anything they ever did. Oh, yeah. Um, and they, you know, that's, um, they've done a lot of Bush things before and since. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm not going to, but I thought that was horrible. Uh, that's and incredible. They, they, I didn't even know that. I was a little kid. I was nine, nine years old. Yeah. I was in school. But that is totally Bush. And now, of course, back then they didn't have as many press conferences as they do now because they didn't. There was no 24-hour sports cycle. There was no sports talk radio. So they probably felt they could get away with saving a few shekels and not having a press conference. And 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 but that's a, that's a terrible way to do it. It's terrible disrespect to Joan, his widow, and Irene, his daughter. It's just just just. Yeah. I'm just and, shocked hearing this that that it happened. Yeah. That way. Irene, his daughter, is a mutual friend of ours on Facebook, and um, she's been on this network uh, a, no- a number of times. Ron Rabinovich, who is um, a great Jackie aficionado, was a friend of Jackie when he was 10 years old. Ron was introduced to Jackie by his dad, and they remained pen pals uh, and they write each other uh, letters and um, um, Ron published an excellent book for children about Jackie Robinson and to give him some credit speaking of books it was the number one uh, rated the number one book children's nonfiction in baseball book so um, I don't know if that was Amazon or what, but uh, uh, Ron is a tremendous uh, member of the comfortably zoned family, as you have become. Um, thank you for another great, uh, great listen, my friend. You were, um, you were, like I say, an inspiration for us writing the book. Um, uh, anytime we felt. Uh, Waylay, we can't do this or we can't do that. We think, wow, Don, Don has accomplished so much with, uh, and he's blind. So uh, watch us go, that type of thing. Uh, Ralph, I hope that I can take this away from this press conference, this, this um, podcast that we have done and Take take what you said away from it and use it to motivate myself to finish my own book, so that you know someday, probably a couple of years from now, you know folks will be able to read how it was for me as a baseball oh. broadcaster. Boy, if um, put me in the same classification as you, as a motivator, <laughs> wow! You made my you made my day, my friend, and. Um, I know when George hears this, he will make his day too. You, you've been terrific, and uh, just like to thank you again for being who you are. It's my pleasure. Beautiful. It's the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm Ralph Tycho. It is um, a pleasure, Don Wardlow. Thank you for listening, everybody. Happy trails and adios. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.